The Battle of Midway, June 3rd to June 6th, 1942, was one of the decisive naval battles of history. The engagement was decided entirely by air power, with no surface gun action. At Midway, the Japanese repeated the pattern of the Coral Sea one month before. They approached in widely separated groups, seeking to draw out the American forces, and included a secondary operation, the Aleutians. The Doolittle Raid on Tokyo of April 18, 1942, strongly influenced Japanese plans. The Japanese High Command accelerated their advance into the Solomons and New Guinea. Further advances were planned to include New Caledonia, the Fiji Islands, and Samoa. These to be followed by the capture of the strategic island of Midway and the occupation of the Aleutians. Many of these objectives had been set forth in previous plans. But the Battle of the Coral Sea had checked the Japanese advance southward by sea. The advance to the eastward was then ordered by Imperial headquarters. Thus, the lines of American communication would be cut, the areas west of Pearl Harbor would be denied, the balance of naval power in the Pacific would be upset. The Japanese commander-in-chief combined fleet felt that as a result of Pearl Harbor, the American fleet was temporarily inferior. But the American industrial potential made a fleet action imperative on the part of Japan. The approaches to Japan must be strengthened. By departing from their established naval policy of holding their fleet in Japanese-controlled waters, and threatening something the Americans prized, the Americans might then feel compelled to commit their weaker forces and thus be brought to a vulnerable position. Thus, he hoped to bring off a decisive battle near Midway. Preceding the Midway attack by one day, there was to be reconnaissance in force against Dutch Harbor, which was to be struck a paralyzing blow to cover the seizure of Edak, Kiska, and Atu. This move would act as a diversion to Midway. Kiska and Midway could be used as bases for barrier patrols to detect any surprise penetration toward the heart of the Empire. The Japanese commander believed that there would not be any powerful American units with carriers near Midway. He believed that the Americans patrolled daily west and south of Midway at a radius of 500 miles, but were not as vigilant in the northern area. He estimated the defenses of Midway to be strong and that submarines operated in the area that Midway had two squadrons of flying reconnaissance boats, one squadron of army bombers, one squadron of fighters, and that this air strength could be doubled in an emergency. This was an excellent estimate. Here is the Japanese commander's estimate of the American surface units in the Hawaiian area. He estimated two to three carriers. Actually, there were three. He also estimated two to three special carriers and two battleships. But there were none in the Hawaiian area. He estimated four to five heavy cruisers when actually there were seven three to four light cruisers, there was only one, and four very light cruisers, of which none were present. His estimate of 30 destroyers was correct, but at the time of the battle, only 14 were in the Midway area. 
his estimate of 25 submarines was correct. The Japanese commander of the Aleutian forces believed that at Dutch Harbor there were considerable military installations and patrol craft, but he felt it could be captured easily. He also believed that Kiska and Atu had military installations and patrol craft. He estimated that normally there were 20 patrol planes and 10 fighters at Dutch Harbor, that two squadrons of patrol planes were in Kodiak and one squadron at Sitka. This was a fair estimate, but his failure to learn of the newly constructed Army airfield at Fort Glenn on Umnak Island had an adverse effect on the conduct of his operations. All the Japanese fleets, including the naval air fleets, but excepting the China Seas fleet, were under the command of the Commander-in-Chief Combined Fleet, Admiral Isoroku Yamamoto. For the midway operation, the Combined Fleet was organized into six coordinate task forces. Mobile Force, Main Force, Midway Occupation Force, Northern Force, Base Air Force, and the Submarine Force. The strength of these task forces was as follows. The mobile force consisted of four first-line carriers, the Kaga, Akagi, Soryu, and Hiryu, carrying a total of 234 aircraft. These were screened by two battleships, the Haruna and Kirishima. These ships possessed high speed and light armor. Two heavy cruisers, the Tone and the Chikuma. One light cruiser, the Nagara, and 12 destroyers. The force was self-supporting and accompanied by its own surprise ships. This powerful offensive weapon was designed to meet any American threat. But in spite of the lesson of the Coral Sea, the Japanese did not feel the need of more ships for anti-aircraft fire. The main force was composed of one aircraft carrier, the Zuiho, seven battleships, the Nagato, the Mutsu, the Ise, the 65,000-ton Yamato, the Hyuga, the Fuso, and the Yamashiro, three light cruisers, the Kitagami, the Oi, and the Sendai, 15 destroyers, and four supply ships. This powerful surface force should have been able to defeat the Americans if it had moved against them. The Midway Occupation Force consisted of five groups. The second fleet group Two battleships, the Congo and the Hiei. Four heavy cruisers, the Atago, Chokai, Haguro, and Miyoko. One light cruiser, the Yuri. Seven destroyers and three uh, supply ships. The transport group totaled 13 transports and supply ships. And a cross screen with the light cruiser, Jinsu, 11 destroyers, and three patrol boats. The close support group, four heavy cruisers, the Kumano, Suzuya, Mogami, and Mikuma, screened by four destroyers. The seaplane tender group, and the minesweeper group. The northern force, designed to capture certain Aleutian islands, was composed of three groups. The second mobile task group, the carrier Ryujo and the carrier Junyo. Two heavy cruisers, the Takao and the Maya. Three destroyers and an oiler. 
the Kiska occupation group, two right cruisers, the Kiso and the Tama, five destroyers, two auxiliary cruisers, two transports, three gunboats, and eight sub chasers. The ADAC Atu occupation group, a light cruiser, the Abukuma, five destroyers, a transport, a mine rear, and one auxiliary seaplane carrier. The Japanese forces proceeded toward their destination more or less independently. The mobile force left Hiroshima Bay May 26. At a point 450 miles southeast of Tokyo, it rendezvoused with its supply units. On June 3rd, it was 600 miles northwest of Midway. The main force also departed Hiroshima Bay May 26th. On June 3rd, the main force divided into two groups, the main group and the Aleutian support group, which headed toward the Aleutians. The Midway Occupation Force left Japanese waters in widely separated groups. The Minor Sweeper Group departed Saipan May 25th for Midway via Wake Island. The Transport Group, the Seaplane Tender Group, and the Coast Support Group left Saipan May 27th and 28th. The second fleet group left Japan May 28th. This group took position on the left flank of the transport group, seldom closer than 50 miles. The northern force left Japanese waters in three separate groups. The second mobile task group left Honshu Bay May 25th and headed for a point 400 miles from Dutch Harbor. The Kiska Occupation Group left Honshu Bay on May 27th for Paramushiro To and from there departed for Kiska Island on June 1st. The Edak Atu Occupation Group left Honshu Bay on May 28th for the Aleutian waters. These were the positions of the Japanese forces at 0900 June 3rd. These were the American forces in that area at that time. Throughout this film, the movements of the Japanese forces will be shown in black, the American forces in white. The broad Japanese plan for the midway operation appears sound, but the wide deployment of the principal forces does not appear sound. The main force could not support the mobile or the occupation force unless they retired upon the main force, which was 600 miles to the westward of the mobile force and an equal distance to the northwestward of the occupation force. The deployment of the northern force was well planned. The raid on Dutch Harbor did succeed in furnishing a diversion from Midway. Admiral Chester W. Nimitz, Commander-in-Chief U.S. Pacific Fleet, SINCPAC, was directed on April 3rd to assume command of all the armed forces in the Pacific Ocean area. Early in May, intelligence reached Sinkpak that caused him to believe the Japanese planned an invasion thrust at Midway and the Aleutians early in June. 
This information was remarkably complete. Sinkpack not only considered that he knew of the projected operations, but also he had quite comprehensive information of the strength of Japanese forces involved, their general direction of approach, and the approximate date on which each phase of the operation was to be launched. From this information, Sinkpack was able to make this estimate of the Japanese combatant ships to be used in the midway action. Let us compare this estimate with a number of Japanese ships that were actually present. The estimate of carriers, heavy cruisers and submarines was reasonably correct. But his estimate of the number of Japanese battleships, light cruisers and destroyers was seriously in error. Commanding Officer Naval Air Station, Midway, expected that the Japanese carriers would not launch their planes at a greater distance than 200 miles. A search to 700 miles, the limiting radius of a PBY under bomb load, seemed adequate to meet this condition. He placed in operation a 22-plane search with PBYs. These searches were augmented by an 800-mile search from Oahu and a 700-mile search from Johnston Island to cover probable approaches to Pearl Harbor. Commanding Officer Naval Air Station, Midway, also knew that ordinarily an area of reduced visibility could be expected about three to 400 miles to the northwest of Midway. He felt that the Japanese commander, after leaving bad weather, would wait for dawn to fix his position before launching planes. Since dawn was about 0415, the Japanese might be expected to strike midway at 0600. The Japanese actually struck at 0630, June 4th. Sink Pack's commander in Aleutian waters had received intelligence on May 28th that the Japanese had one task group earmarked for the capture of Kiska and another for Attu but he feared that this information was a deception to draw the American naval forces westward so the Japanese could move in behind them. He estimated that the most probable area of a Japanese landing would be the Omnak Dutch Harbor Cold Bay area and decided to defend this area. His freedom of action was apparently seriously affected as he was forced to rely upon land-based aircraft for the essential protection of his ships. The number of his airplanes was limited. Also, there were no airfields west of Fort Glenn. In addition, the distances between his naval surface forces and the bases from which his supporting aircraft operated, plus the almost total lack of darkness in a military sense, which darkness affected his ability to move without detection, all complicated his problem. His overall plan for the defense of Alaska appears sound but his means available were not adequate. The sending of surface forces to the Aleutians was a difficult decision. Sink Pack believed Midway was the primary objective, and here he should maintain strength. But the Aleutians were the gateway to Alaska. If seized, American morale would suffer. Corregidor had fallen only three weeks before. On May 12th, Commander-in-Chief U.S. Fleet, Cominch, and Chief of Staff, U.S. Army, informed all subordinates that area boundaries should in no way restrict operations aiding the common cause. This avoided the boundary restraint of the Coral Sea action. On May 14th, a state of fleet-opposed invasion in the Hawaiian coastal and sea frontiers was declared. The principal responsibility to oppose the invasion was given to the Navy with unity of command in sink pack. On May 21st, Cominch declared a prospective state of fleet opposed invasion in the Aleutians. At the same time, sink pack formed Task Force 8, the Northern Pacific Force, under command of Rear Admiral Robert A. Theobald, U.S. Navy, to oppose advance of the enemy in the Aleutian Alaska area. Commander Task Force 8 designated the Naval Air Detachment, Alaskan Aleutian Area, 
as Task Group 8.1, under command of Captain Ellie Garys, U.S. Navy, and the 11th Air Force as the Air Striking Group, Task Group 8.3, under the command of Brigadier General S.B. Butler, U.S. Army. This was not in accordance with the Joint Chiefs of Staff Directive that, in order to obtain unified air operations, Commander Alaskan Army Air was to command all Army and Navy air groups in Alaska. By this division of command, unity of command of all air forces in Alaska ceased to exist. Task Force One, composed of the old battleships, was located at San Francisco. It took no active part in the battle. Commander Task Force 11, Rear Admiral Aubrey Fitch in the Chester, was anchored at San Diego June 3rd, arriving from Tonga Tabu June 1st. Task Group 11.1, the carrier Saratoga, the cruiser San Diego, and four destroyers were en route toward Pearl Harbor, commanded by Captain D.C. Ramsey, U.S. Navy, in the carrier Saratoga. Task Force 7, the submarine force was divided into Task Group 7.1, the Midway Patrol of 12 submarines. Task Group 7.2, the Support Patrol of 3 submarines. Task Group 7.3, the Oahu Patrol of 4 submarines. Commander Task Force 7 was Rear Admiral Robert H. English, U.S. Navy. He stationed his submarines as indicated because SYNCPAC's intelligence pointed to a Japanese attack through the Northwest Quadrant. Task Force 16, under the command of Rear Admiral Raymond A. Spruance, had been recently recalled to Pearl Harbor from the South Pacific area. Task Force 16 consisted of two first-line carriers, the Enterprise and Hornet, five heavy cruisers for screen, the Vincennes, New Orleans, Minneapolis, Pensacola, Northampton, one light cruiser, the Atlanta, and nine destroyers, the Phelps, Balch, Ellett, Maury, Monaghan, Warden, Aylwin, Benham, and Cunningham. Task Force 17, under the command of Rear Admiral Frank Jack Fletcher, with the carrier Yorktown damaged in the Battle of the Coral Sea, arrived in Pearl Harbor, May 27th. The rapidity of emergency repairs allowed Task Force 17 to sortie three days later. Task Force 17 had the Yorktown, a screen of two heavy cruisers, the Astoria and Portland, and five destroyers, the Russell, Hughes, Morris, Anderson, and Hammond. Task Force 16 sortied from Pearl Harbor, May 28th. Task Force 17 sortied May 30th. Task Force 17 rendezvoused with Task Force 16, June 2nd. On June 3rd, they were 320 miles from Midway. The two task forces operated independently. It was then believed that a one-carrier task group could maneuver better under air attack and avoid collisions. This striking force, Task Force 16 and Task Force 17, was the main opposition to the seizure of Midway. Its air groups were well trained, although the Hornet crew lacked combat experience in the Pacific. Sinkpak placed this striking force where he could either outflank the expected Japanese forces or transfer it to the Aleutians. Cominch directed Sinkpak to oppose the Japanese forces by attrition tactics only and not to unduly risk cruisers and carriers. In compliance, Sinkpak directed his striking force commanders to be governed by the principle of calculated risk the avoidance of exposure to attack by superior forces without good prospect of inflicting greater damage to the enemy. This completes the background for the actions at Midway and in the Aleutians. 